So, uh, so my name is is Joe Henderson. I'm a faculty member here at Paul Smith's. I'm in the Environment and Society Department. Um, I'm one of the few social scientists on the campus. We have a few. Um, and I get to teach classes. I have the privilege of teaching classes that deal with some of the issues that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, social injustice, the, the prison system, policing, race, class, gender, um, how those things all relate to the environment. Um, as a new, I'll, I'll speak now just as a new kind of like Adirondack resident, someone who moved here from upstate New York, but moved here three or four years ago. Um, and uh, I'm trained as an anthropologist as well. So I'm kind of highly attuned to culture and what's going on around in the kind of milieu of the towns. And it was really, really interesting to me to, um, to watch uh, and to try to see how the cultures of the Adirondacks and the North Country are so shaped by the prison system, by um, the military installations, the Fort Drum that's up here. Um, and so I think it's a, a really interesting um, uh, kind of cultural uh, thing that we should be talking about. And so um, when I found out that uh, Dr. Jeff Hall had written a whole book about this, I was like, we need to get him um, to campus. Jeff, it's we, you know, in normal times, it would be great to have you to the actual campus. But um, but these are not normal times. So here we are. So um, I guess a couple of things uh, be before we get to your talk, I want to say a formal thank you, as always, to Jill. Jill, um, always, it's a pleasure to work with you, and I love working with you, and thank you for all of the help that goes into this. Um, thank you to Aaron Cass, who is in the library. Um, Aaron was really instrumental in helping out with some of this stuff as well. There's a lot of people here who are either my students or Jeff's students. So Jeff, maybe you can actually talk about your, uh, in a minute when you introduce yourself, you know, talk about the institution where you are and, and what that looks like. Because um, we are a very rural, um, not entirely, but very white school. And, um, and, and it's, it's fun that we have different kinds of institutions here together. And one of the things I'm constantly talking about with my own students is how there are similar issues that face urban and rural areas. And they're, they're often connected in ways that we don't talk about nearly enough. Um, so a, uh, a couple of things to know about Jeff. Um, he, uh, Dr. Hall is an assistant professor in the Department of History um, at Queensborough. Uh, which is part of the CUNY system. And maybe you can, can talk about what the CUNY system is for people who aren't familiar with that. Um, he has bachelor's and master's degrees from Binghamton University, did his PhD in history at Stony Brook University. Um, he is from the area and is, uh, in, uh, and I believe he was telling me earlier, his father worked at Danamora, still works at Danamora, Jeff? Or No, my father's deceased, but he oh, retired from there. Deceased. So worked at Danamora. Um, it is, uh, it teaches a whole bunch of really interesting classes, recent American civilization, um, history of New York state, environmental history of North America, very much working in the tradition of environmental history, which is a really interesting tradition if people are unfamiliar with it. Um, he is uh, a first generation scholar, uh, as am I. So we are, we are the first in our families to go to college and and probably weirdly first ones to get PhDs, which is always a fun conversation to have with your family when they're like, what, what do you do? Um, it's, uh, and, and also um, uh, Jeff also just got his second COVID shot. And so we will bear with you as you go through that. One thing to say, just a, a, a last kind of bit of context. And I think it's really important as a social scientist to mention some of this context. Um, the United States has one of the highest, actually the highest incarceration rate in the world. Um, we, we have 2.2 million people in prisons in the United States out of a population of roughly three, 350 million or so um, people. It is the highest incarceration rate in the world, higher than Russia, higher than China. Um, it is, uh, it is, we have 737 people per 100,000 uh, citizens in prison in the United States. It is a system that is deeply racist. It is a system that is deeply classist. Not everybody is policed and imprisoned the same way. And, um, and it is a system that shapes a lot of rural communities in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, as a social scientist, when I do demographic data, um, I have to actually think about the racial demographics of how I'm gonna kind of deal with the, the kind of clusters of different demographics in the park. 
it's a it's a really interesting um, thing to think about academically, but it's also it is a lived reality for many many people. Um, many of the highest COVID rates in the North Country have been in the prison system, um, and and uh, and Jeff, maybe you know this, but are, is New York State even uh, inoculating prisoners yet? Uh, I think they've started. Yeah. They've started. Okay. Yeah, they're they're yeah. getting their second shots now. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, and, and I know you'll tell us all about the history. You have many people here who are who are from the kind of North Country, and so, um, so uh, the way this is going to work for everybody, um, we will. Je Jeff has has prepared a presentation that's about twenty five minutes, thirty minutes, around seven forty five. Um, please submit your questions and answers uh, using the Q&A function. Um, I will moderate the, Q and, the questions and answers. So I'll be looking at the, all of that stuff during the presentation so Jeff doesn't have to be distracted by that. Um, I will select some really good questions and we'll have a discussion for about 20 minutes or so. Um, the chat, we are not going to monitor the chat. So, um, so, you know, you can say hi to your friends if you want, but it's not something that we're going to pay attention to. Um, this will ultimately be recorded. Uh, it is being recorded right now. Um, so so you, we will have, my students will have access to it going forward. Um, Jeff, it's a pleasure to have you and, and thank you for being here and um, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Joe. And thanks, Jill, as well, for uh, helping out with organizing this event. And uh, thanks to everybody at Paul Smith's College for their help in uh, getting the event put together for inviting me uh, under these conditions. I'm glad that we're all able to be together uh, to talk about the work that I've done and um, hopefully introduce you all to some history that maybe you haven't learned before and maybe some different ways of thinking about prisons and the environment. Uh, Joe mentioned that I teach at Queensborough Community College, which is one of the seven community colleges of the City University of New York. It's located in Bayside, Queens. It's on the eastern edge of Queens, very close to Nassau County. So it's a more suburban uh, section of Queens than uh, some of the areas of central and western Queens. Uh, I've taught there since 2014. I'll be going up for tenure next year. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I did have my second COVID vaccine yesterday morning. So uh, I'm starting to feel some of the side effects now, actually. So uh, hopefully I will make it through uh, to the conclusion of this event. Uh, I want to say hi to my students who are uh, in the in the event this evening. We've never met in person. So um, it's nice to see a lot of you here. Thanks for coming. You'll get your extra credit. So, um, you know, sit back, relax, hopefully enjoy. Um, and I will, as Joe said, I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to read uh, directly from a paper that I've written that uh, basically summarizes some of the main points and argument uh, that I've written about in the book. And then, as Joe said, when I'm finished, we will have some time for some uh, discussion. So if you do have questions while I'm uh, talking, please feel free to put those in the Q&A and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about them. So I'm going to start uh, talking. I'm gonna share some slides with you that I have put together and I'm going to start talking. So incarceration has always been an environmental problem. Questions surrounding how and where to confine individuals convicted of unlawful activity have occupied New York policymakers for over two centuries. With few exceptions, state officials from the 1790s through the 1990s did not question the propriety of incarceration. This proved true even when prisons became dangerously overcrowded. The causes of overcrowding were nearly the same in 1845 when Clinton State Prison in Dannemora, the first prison built in this part of New York, opened up as they were in 1976 when the North Country's second prison, Camp Adirondack in Raybrook, welcomed its first incarcerated men. 
The criminalization of urban poverty contributed to spiraling convictions in the 19th and 20th centuries. In the earlier period, the allure of industrial jobs spurred rapid population growth in cities like New York. Contending with low wages, unhealthful housing, and dangerous working conditions, poor New Yorkers often turned to unlawful activities that landed many in Manhattan's Newgate Prison, which was New York's first prison, which was opened uh, in, the set in the early 1790s. And actually you can go and find the building where it was today, it's in the West Village. Unfortunately, a high conviction rate and limited cell space quickly yielded an overcrowded, unsanitary and violent penitentiary. Instead of addressing the conditions driving unlawful activity, lawmakers responded by building new prisons. However, new cells alone would not and could not solve the problem of overcrowding. Each new penitentiary New York opened between 1817 and 1845, Auburn, Sing Sing, which many of you have probably heard of, and Clinton quickly surpassed capacity, guaranteeing the problems that drove their creation would continue in perpetuity. Fast forward to the late 20th century. The ranks of the urban poor grew in tandem with the flight of industrial jobs from cities across New York State. People of color bore the brunt of deindustrialization, driving many toward violent and nonviolent activities that sometimes involved narcotics. As unlawful activity gripped New York's urban centers, and amid a broader backlash against the achievements of the civil rights movement. In 1973, lawmakers in Albany mandated long prison terms, both for individuals convicted of possessing controlled narcotics. These are the infamous Rockefeller drug laws and for those convicted of multiple felonies. Skyrocketing convictions drove thousands of primarily African-American and Latino men into prisons that by 1975 were filled to capacity. With its criminal justice policies enjoying broad bipartisan support, New York embarked on a new round of prison expansion. And here is that expansion graphically illustrated. The North Country environment proved attractive to lawmakers and correctional planners in search of cell space. We'll begin in Dannemora, which you can see is up in the top right-hand corner of our map here, just to orient folks who are not familiar with this region. Though geographically remote and undeveloped, in the early 1840s, lawmakers envisioned a prison in the Adirondacks that would both remedy overcrowding and through the poorly paid labor of incarcerated men, transform the North Country from a rural backwater into an industrial powerhouse. With no restrictions on either the use or development of local natural resources, planners unleashed a far-reaching environmental transformation. State officials seized 20,000 acres of land for prison use, and you can see some of that in this, this image, locking away water, timber, and minerals from local users. They set incarcerated men to work cutting trees, excavating and grading hillsides, digging channels, blasting holes, building roads, mining iron ore, and erecting prison infrastructure. And the prison that many of you are probably familiar with in Dannemora today, this is what it looked like um, you know, as it entered its 25th year in 1869. So it's obviously more modern today than it was back then, but it occupies the same area and some of the same buildings are actually still there. 
By 1865, the Dannemora area bore little resemblance to the relatively pristine environment of 20 years before. However, relentless growth in the population of convicted men guaranteed Clinton would be as ineffective at solving overcrowding as Auburn and Sing Sing before it. Overcrowded by 1865, Clinton's population and environmental footprint would continue to expand through the late 19th and 20th centuries. A penitentiary that confined over 500 convicted men in 1865 would hold nearly 3,000 by the early 1970s. It took little time for New Yorkers to feel the full impact of the Rockefeller drug laws. By 1975, overcrowding in New York's 32 prisons prompted calls for increased capacity. So you see this history repeating itself again. Amid a recession in the 1970s, lawmakers scoured the state for mothballed residential facilities that could be easily repurposed as penitentiaries. At the same time, state leaders hoped new prisons might revive rural economies beset by deindustrialization, depopulation, unemployment, and poverty. As in the 1840s, lawmakers intended North Country prisons to achieve both penal and economic objectives. However, by the mid 1970s, the days of unrestricted prison induced environmental change in the Adirondacks were over, or were they? And this is one of the important themes that I analyze in my book. By the 1970s, a panoply of environmental regulations governed land use and natural resource development in the Adirondacks. Beginning in the 1880s, and accelerating in the 1970s, lawmakers sought to balance economic development with environmental protection in a region prized by industrialists, residents, and visitors. So again, here is a map of the Adirondack Park in Northeastern New York. Created in 1892, the six million acre Adirondack Park remains a patchwork of public and private lands. And I'll show you what I'm talking about right here. All of the dark green were forest preserve lands where development is not allowed. In 1892, when the park was created, you can see the forest reserve has increased in size during the past 125 years but you also see a lot of white on the map, which indicates lands that are privately owned. So it's an unusual park. It's not the same type of park that many of you might be accustomed to, especially my students um, who live in New York. While Article 14 of the New York State Constitution enacted in 1894, protects forest preserve lands as forever wild and free from development and open to outdoor play. Until the early 1970s, the park's private landowners could use their properties largely without restriction. Concerned that unlimited development might threaten the very qualities that drove visitors, excuse me, I'm gonna turn the page, and business people to the Adirondacks. In the first place, lawmakers created the Adirondack Park Agency or APA in 1971. The creation of the APA coincided with the birth of the modern environmental movement. Empowered to regulate building projects on both private and public lands, the park agency quickly drew the ire of permanent residents convinced it was an environmental organization in disguise promoting the interests of the wealthy at the expense of low-income homeowners desperate for economic uplift. This is a photo that I took in the Adirondack Museum. I had trouble actually getting access to the original 
for inclusion in my my slides. So I've just taken the photo that I took of the photo and I'm showing it uh, to you guys right now. This was a protest in 1970 in Saranac Lake against the formation of the Adirondack Park Agency, which at that time um, had not yet um, actually been formed, but was being planned and was very likely going to happen. The arrival of prisons in the Adirondack Park, however, showed the APA and other government regulators were neither closet environmentalists nor reflexively anti-development. So what people, what many people thought the APA was and what it actually turned out to be were often two different things. And uh, the APA's involvement in prison building in particular uh, shows that, and I show that in my book. To the contrary, agencies assumed by many to be guardians of the environment could be its worst enemy. The federal prison in the Essex County hamlet of Raybrook provides a case in point. And you can see Raybrook there sort of in the center of the map in Essex County. In 1976, the New York State Department of Correctional Services, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and the Lake Placid Olympic Organizing Committee vied for control of Raybrook's shuttered 540 acre tuberculosis hospital to solve their respective housing dilemmas, right? The state prison system was almost at 100% capacity in 1976. The Federal Bureau of Prisons, which operates federal prisons across the country, was also facing capacity issues. And the organizers of the 1980 Winter Olympics, which were being held in Lake Placid, did not yet have housing for athletes and coaches who were uh, going to be attending the Winter Games. Once the, the owner of this old tuberculosis hospital, New York State, repurposed the complex as a minimum security prison in August of 1976, the Bureau of Prisons and Lake Placid's Olympic organizers joined forces to build a new facility across the road from the new state prison, which is known, was known as Camp Adirondack, that would serve first as Olympic housing and later as a federal medium security penitentiary. So the athletes that participated, uh, not all of them, but many of the athletes who participated in the Winter Games in 1980 spent several weeks inside a facility that later became a federal pr uh, prison. Once the deal was finalized to build this new facility, the gears of New York's environmental bureaucracy began to turn. The 155 acre properties classification as private property left the project open to the Adirondack Park Agency's binding advisory review process a time-consuming process that could require either design modifications or the project's cancellation. To prevent such outcomes, the APA, which is again, this sort of boogeyman, reclassified the property as state land, a decision that exposed it to potential scrutiny from the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is the bureaucrat, who are the bureaucratic guardians of the park's public land. To bar that outcome, right? So the park agency steps in again. The park agency urged the Bureau of Prisons to seize the property through eminent domain, eliminating the possibility of review by any New York environmental regulator. Far from being tree huggers in disguise, which many people, I think even today assume they are, the APA played a pivotal role in bringing a third prison to the Adirondack Park. Land in hand, Bureau of Prisons contractors began transforming the Raybrook environment in June of 1977. And this is an overhead shot of what the construction site looked like by the fall of 1977. 
uh, after the removal of dozens of acres of forest and the excavation of several million cubic yards of, uh, of soil and the flattening of the site. Without a plan to mitigate environmental impacts, and this is 1977, this is after the environmental movement was in full swing, after the EPA had been established, after a lot of environmental laws were already in place. Without a plan to mitigate environmental impacts, they quickly removed 75 acres of forest and excavated 1 million cubic acres of earth. The Bureau also announced plans to op open to build open air sewage collection reservoirs in close proximity to homes adjacent to the property. Then in August of 1977, heavy rains washed over 400 tons of dirt and wood chips into local waterways. The resulting sedimentation endangered plant and animal populations and polluted fresh water supplies. Only months earlier, the APA's nonpartisan scientists had warned of such an outcome. Without jurisdiction over federal land, however, New York's environmental regulators could do nothing. For its part, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, denied any responsibility for the cleanup, arguing since the complex would first be used for Olympic housing, a future federal prison being built on federal land was not, in fact, a federal project subject to federal regulation. The Bureau's contractors only grudgingly agreed to take steps to prevent future disasters after New York State threatened to sue the federal government for pollution of state waterways by federal debris. And it's a completely crazy story. And after Congress warned that it would withhold critical construction funding and workers pay and potentially leave the project undone before the Olympics. The construction of the Federal Correctional Institute Raybrook which opened in September 1980 and operates to this day, thus exposed significant limitations built into regulations and agencies, many assumed guardians of environmental and public health. And this is what the completed facility looked like just a couple months before the Olympics in late 1979. And it really looks more or less the same uh, today. In the 1980s and 1990s, New York State planned prisons in the Adirondack Park villages of Gabriel's, Lion Mountain, and Tupper Lake. As state-sponsored projects, the APA would play a more active role than in Raybrook. Though the agency's regulatory power over state projects inside the park was restricted to non-binding advisory review, guaranteeing it could not stop a prison from opening. APA bureaucrats' subjective understanding of which environments would be most prison friendly often made agency regulation uneven and hard to predict. Gabriel's and Lion Mountain provide useful examples, and I know that the Gabriel's story is uh, part of the history of Paul Smith's College. While the Park Agency's political wing, comprised of commissioners appointed by the governor and its nonpartisan scientists, opposed the 1981 proposal to build a minimum security prison in the Franklin County hamlet of Gabriel's, the two wings diverged over plans to open a similar facility in the Clinton County hamlet of Lion Mountain just three years later in 1984. And that's just a point that I'll stop and, and reiterate. When we think about environmental regulators, it's important to remember that it's, I think, easy to sort of paint them with one brush, right? Whether you are an environmentalist or not. 
But it's important to remember that there are career professional employees who work for environmental agencies who are nonpartisan. And then there are often uh, the officials who lead those agencies who are often political appointees. And they don't always work in tandem. If you followed the um, Environmental Protection Agency under the administration of President Trump, for example, you know that there was significant tension between the political leadership and uh, the career employees and the scientists who worked for the agency. And the same was often true in the APA. So the APA political wing and scientific wing agreed that a prison for Gabriel's should not happen, but the two wings diverged over whether a prison should be built in Lion Mountain. Why the difference? Why did the same uh, set of scientists and commissioners um, see these, these environments differently and think a prison was okay in one place but not in another? We should consider each community's environment. While Gabriel's pine forests and rugged terrain attracted visitors and seasonal homeowners seeking a wilderness getaway, Decades of unrestricted industrial activity had turned Lion Mountain into a symbol of post-industrial blight. And I'll just draw your attention to this photo for a minute. I took this picture about a year ago. You see the former prison there um, right in the center of the image. One of those buildings used to be a high school. This was a, uh, a high school that was repurposed as a prison in 1983 and 84. But if you look off into the distance there, you see a building sort of on the left-hand side off on a hillside. That's an old iron mining facility uh, that was owned by a couple different mining companies that dominated Lion Mountain through much of its history. And over on the right-hand side of the image, you see what looks like a sort of a little hill there. It's gray in color. Uh, that's an old pile of iron ore tailings, so basically industrial waste that was left behind when the mines closed in the late 1960s. While correctional facilities opened in both communities, APA officials clearly viewed one as more prison appropriate than the other. So more prison appropriate to build a prison uh, in a place like Lion Mountain, which is a post-industrial uh, sort of ruined community, not so much in Gabriel's, which was more um, in keeping with people's ideas of what the Adirondack Park and what the wilderness um, is all about. The state's shifting political winds also played an important role in park agency oversight. The case of the Franklin County village of Tupper Lake is instructive. From 1981 to 1996, town officials in Tupper Lake urged state leaders to locate a penitentiary in their community. Failing to secure a prison in 1981, and again in 1987, village officials tried again in 1989. However, skepticism from park agency commissioners appointed by Democratic Governor Mario Cuomo and the prospect of time-consuming APA review drove the Corrections Department to build outside the park that year. So the Corrections Department eventually came to realize, you know, it's probably easier to build prisons outside the park to avoid dealing with environmental regulators. When lawmakers did award Tupper Lake a prison in 1997, however, less environmentally minded APA commissioners appointed by Republican Governor George Pataki, worked closely with corrections to ensure a quick and simple construction. Were it not for the intervention of local residents and environmentalists, a potentially destructive penitentiary blessed with APA approval might have opened in Tupper Lake. Which brings me to my final point. While New York State erected an impressive environmental bureaucracy between the 1880s and 1970s, regulatory limitations and political influence often created equally impressive barriers to preserving environmental and public health 
in communities targeted for prison expansion. Prison building damaged forests, wetlands, and wildlife populations, in addition to exposing residents and visitors to untold health and safety risks. Accordingly, homeowners, tourists, and organized environmentalists undertook informal oversight of prison construction projects across the region. Residents and visitors in Raybrook, Gabriel's, and Tupper Lake banded together to expose prison's potential to harm environmental and public health. This is a document I found during my research. This was uh, related to a topic that I'm going to address in just a moment. Sometimes these prison opponents achieved impressive results including forcing the Bureau of Prisons both to cancel its sewage collection plan, which posed great danger to fresh water supplies near uh, the federal prison site, and to abandon on two different occasions, plans to build a second federal prison in Raybrook. And that's what this map, this hand-drawn map of Raybrook uh, is showing us, right? This group called Concerned Citizens of Raybrook created this image in 1983. This was 1983 was the first time that the Federal Bureau of Prisons tried to build a second federal prison in Raybrook and the community organized against that and successfully stopped it. And they successfully stopped a second effort, a uh, similar effort in 1990. Moreover, opposition from Gabriel's residents compelled corrections to surrender unused lands at the prison site, once owned by Paul Smith's college, for inclusion in the forest preserve. So you see these people who actually picketed at Paul Smith's college in August of 1981 uh, as students and their families were arriving for the fall semester and actually stopped cars and told people that the college was actually trying to sell a piece of its property for use as a minimum security prison. And this group, as I just mentioned, didn't was not able to stop the prison from opening, but was successfully able to stop all of the land in Gabriel's from being used for the prison. And a significant chunk of that land was actually given back to the state and uh, folded into the forest preserve. Unfortunately, however, locals' motives were not always pure. Many prison opponents, mainly white and well-to-do, couched their criticisms of the encroaching correctional system in sometimes blatantly racist terms. And this was a letter written by an opponent of the prison in Gabriel's to the Adirondack Park Agency, you can see in November of 1981. And you know, you can read the, the text and see that uh, this person didn't really, uh, didn't pull his punches, right? We'll just uh, leave it at that. Um, and felt no uh, qualms, I guess, about using really objectionable language to describe uh, people in prison. Find my spot here. So this is just one example, by the way, of many uh, pieces of correspondence that contain similar language that I discovered during my research. Others, meanwhile, identified incarcerated men of color and individuals diagnosed with HIV AIDS as threats as severe as those posed to the region's woods and wildlife. However, residents put off by the presence of incarcerated men could not deny the value they brought to the Adirondack environment. Sorry for the quality of these images. I actually had a lot of trouble getting access to originals. So these are uh, actually scans and they're black and white. So um they're not as they're not as great as they could be and i apologize for that 
the poorly paid labor of incarcerated men on conservation, public works, and infrastructure projects, work that goes on to this day, have both generated untold savings to local taxpayers and preserved structures and environments without which few could enjoy life in the Adirondacks. And I have another image of this. These are just two images of incarcerated men working on the ice palace. And for those of you unfamiliar with uh, Saranac Lake or the Adirondacks in general, Saranac Lake hosts um, a winter carnival every year and a large ice palace is the centerpiece of that event. And incarcerated men uh, for many years worked on building uh, that structure. As, incar as incarceration in the North Country continues to wane, right? Three prisons uh, have closed in the past 12 years and a section of the Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamora is slated to close this month. Who will replace these most unexpected stewards of the North Country environment, right? Who will replace these primarily men of color who sometimes work for a dollar a day, performing very important work outdoors. As the prison industry goes into decline, who will do this work? Who will keep the North Country environment um, sustainable uh, remains an open question. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in ordering my book, there is a discount code. And if you use the discount code, you get free shipping. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going um, I'm to I'm take a picture right now of that discount code so I can, <laughs> so I can pick it up um, off the And that's good. Code. Yeah, and that's good until the publisher told me until the end of the year. So cool. um, start your Christmas shopping. Yeah, so so there's there's a lot to talk about, and and we have some really good um, some some really good questions that are coming in, and so I will I will kind of read some of them and 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 uh, and try to summarize some of them. Um, I guess one one early one before we get into to some of the like heavier conceptual and political issues. Um, how, how do you? I, I think Brianna uh, Barcia, who I, I'm guessing might be one of your students. Um, want, wants to know what inspired you to write about this topic? Why, why this topic and not other things? That's a good question. Uh, so I mentioned before, my father worked in uh, Clinton Correctional Facility. That was uh, how he earned a living uh, from 1973 to 1998. So he was working there during that period um, when the prison system was expanding again. And so the prison system was a big part of our life growing up. Um, so I think I wanted to understand more about uh, his experiences working because um, he hated his job, but he never, he, he didn't really talk about it that much. And I guess I wanted to know more about maybe why he hated his job so much and maybe why other people I've talked to who work in the prison system hate their jobs. So that was, I guess, early on where the interest developed. Um, just wanting to learn more about this system that he worked in and that put a roof over our heads and you know put food on our table. I've also always been someone who loves the outdoors. So, I knew I wanted to work in environmental history. And when I was at Stony Brook working on my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, I had to come up with a topic for the dissertation and I had to do something original and something new. And so I decided I would try to look at the history of incarceration in this area through the lens of environmental history because I knew there had to be a connection because of all of the environmental regulations that govern uh, development in the Adirondacks. And so the fact that there were prisons here, um, I didn't really know much about the politics surrounding their construction and their placement, but I knew there had to be a connection. So 
I just began with those sort of personal interests and turned that into a professional career, I guess. What um, you, you uh, uh, well, I guess I actually it just is something interesting to, to, to say about that. Like many, many people who do scholarship end up studying things that are very personally uh, relevant to them. And that's a really valid thing to study. Um, I, sure. I, I studied uh, class differences in education because that's what I had experienced. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's really cool. Um, Sean asked a, a quick question. The, um, the original, um, when they built the federal prison in Raybrook, did they build it intentionally as Olympic athlete dorms, knowing that it was going to turn into a prison? That was always the, that was always the plan. Yeah. That was always the plan. And uh, in fact, the rooms were really tiny and the Olympic organizers were you know, trying to save money. So the rooms were designed to hold two incarcerated men, but the Olympic organizers planned to actually put four athletes in each room. Um, and so one of the, I mean, there are many stories from the Lake Placid Olympics, very, you know, many sort of sort of crazy stories that came out of that event. But one is that many of the athletes who came to Lake Placid that year didn't even stay in the Olympic Village um, because they were afraid of the spread of uh, viruses um, and diseases inside the facility. Um, many stayed in, uh, I know many of the skiers from uh, European countries stayed in Vermont at uh, hotels and uh, private lodges that they rented. And so, yeah, it was definitely planned as a prison, um, as its primary use and it's, you know, temporarily being used to house Olympic athletes and the opponents of the prison called it the Olympic prison. I mean, that was sort of a rallying cry, um, and a way to gain publicity for the opponents when they were trying to get the project stopped. Do you, so uh, the other part of Sean's question is, you know, there's there's a lot of planning going on up here right now for the 2023 World University Games. Have you have you seen any indication that that prisons are again on the menu for for housing the, <laughs> the three three thousand or so international athletes? I, I do know there's been some talk about using uh, like empty dorm space at Paul Smith for that. I don't know how how serious that is, but but um, have you seen anything of, about that? No, I, I, I've been following it pretty closely, actually, um, but I haven't seen anything about where people will be housed. I, I tend to think that if they tried to house people in, you know, like the former prison in Gabriel's, for example, that that would probably um, spark some much justified uh, opposition. Uh, I mean, there's actually plenty of residential space that's empty in the Adirondacks now. Um, so, I mean, there are now empty prisons that can be repurposed as athletic housing, um, you know, sort of in the reverse. But um, I, I'm not sure exactly how uh, they plan to do that. And of course, you know, I have a feeling that Lake Placid will host the Winter Olympics again. Um, I mean, it has all the facilities available. Um, it's hosting the Olympics is becoming very unpopular yeah. uh, internationally. So, you know, the World University Games may be a nice, you know, rehearsal for Lake Placid, as I think it will prepare to host the Winter Olympics again in the future. Um, so, so uh, the, okay, so actually, I'm going to try to weave some questions together here. But the, the high incarceration rates in the 70s that you mentioned primarily resulted from Rockefeller drug laws in New York State. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and is it the case? And I guess, can you can you talk about um, the like who those targeted and, and, and what that like is? Is that related at all to who is imprisoned now in the North Country? Is it still kind of largely war on drugs related? Well, there are definitely still people in prison today in the North Country who were incarcerated at that time. Um, so there are some very elderly people um, in Danamora, for example. They have people in their 70s and 80s uh, incarcerated there. Um, so there are definitely remnants of that uh, criminalization of narcotics from the early 70s today. Uh, but of course, the 
enforcement of those laws has been significantly relaxed over the past 10 to 12 years or so. So there are actually fewer people being sentenced uh, to prison terms for either possession or sale of controlled substances. Uh, and so, and of course that has contributed to the decline in the prison population, which has led to the closure of prisons. So um, definitely there are still people who are going to prison for uh, narcotics offenses, but not, not in the same way as in the 70s and 80s when uh, you know, you had like teenagers um, who might have four ounces of marijuana on them going to prison for 15 years. Those days, I think, are basically over. Yeah, and if and if people aren't familiar with the the kind of racist and classist history of the Rockefeller drug laws, like just read the Wikipedia page on on how it did, did like Rockefeller drug laws disproportionately impacted um, uh, poor people of color and 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 right. punished people at rates that were not at all equitable. Massive kind of injustices for for drug offenses, Co cocaine versus crack. Um, for example. Um, so actually, I, I want to pivot to that for a minute, Jeff, because it's been interesting to read in some of the chats here. Um, you know, there, there are people here from the local community who have said, like, my nephew is a guard, my cousin is a guard. I, I know a bunch of people that work at the prisons. Um, we, I drove home from Paul Smith's today, right past closed Gabriel's, right? And I always, mm -hmm. I always look down that driveway, and I've never been in there. And I'm like, what's in there, right? Um, pr prison closure is very much kind of in the public discourse right now, um, yeah. along and it and it 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 exists kind of in this uncomfortable relationship, and maybe they're separate discourses, but but I think they're related to um, to a growing awareness of of the injustice in the prison system, right? That that there are huge inequities in the ways in which we imprison people and kind of punish people for crimes. Um, what do you make of the, like, as a historian of the, of the fact that now the trajectory seems to be towards prison closures? That seems to be the way that kind of politics are going, right? So le leaving aside the environmental issues, I was, I was like having this fun thought about like nature taking back over Gabriel's, like Camp Gabriel's. Uh, um, sure, but like, yeah. just in terms of the social, political, cultural dynamic, like, how do you, how do you see that? going forward what do you what do you think your your point at the end about who's going to maintain some of these things is really really interesting to think about yeah i mean it definitely looks like we're moving away from the heavy reliance on prisons that defined life in this state over the past half century um and i don't think there is any sort of political will to move in the opposite direction, which would mean back to the days of over incarceration and heavy reliance on prisons. Um, though that could change, right? I mean, the very first prison I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, Newgate, which was opened in 1796, closed by the end of the 1820s, right? It was overcrowded, it was squalid, it was violent. The state uh, simply did not want to invest in having people. Uh, incarcerated there anymore and began building prisons upstate. Um, so prisons have closed in the past. I mean, this isn't something new. Uh, they're closing again and the state's prison population is contracting. But we also have to remember, I mean, I had this conversation with someone a few weeks ago. Um, unlawful activity has been increasing um, during the pandemic, right? The violent crime um, and nonviolent offenses as well, as well have been going up. And uh, there, if this continues, if the pandemic induced recession uh, continues um, you know, for another year, two years or, or even longer, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see some kind of backlash um, against uh, the people who are engaging in the unlawful activity and some sort of public push to uh, put people in prison, right, in large numbers. So uh, we're currently seeing the number of prison, the number, the number of people in prison going down, but, you know, 
history can go in the other direction, right? I mean, we've seen that happen before. And um, if it were to happen again, uh, it wouldn't, it, it would be, it would be surprising, I think now, but it wouldn't be a huge shock, I wouldn't think. So, so a, a question that, um, that someone asked related to this. Um, so it says, uh, as our legal system eliminates outdated racially coded laws and laws that have historically and disproportionately affected minorities, our prisons populations will decrease. How do we educate rural, often white communities that this change is necessary? Well, mandatory is their word uh, in the fight for equal justice, right? Because and and what's interesting is when you look at like my my wife works in Tupper Lake. Uh, the the people who work at Sunmount, which is which is um, a, a kind of institution out there. I don't know. I don't know what you would call it, but it's um, mm -hmm, but. Yeah. But Sunmount, like those are good jobs, right? Good benefits, mm -hmm. often kind of well-paying middle-class jobs. And in an, in an area where the economic inequality is increasing, um, mm -hmm. what are the implications? Uh, it seems like really complicated social implications. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the problems I've been thinking a lot about um, and started doing some writing about actually um, Dan Amora, for example, there was no town there when the state decided to build a prison there in 1842. There was a log cabin that had been used by a couple squatters who lived there and were living off the land. That was it. Um, the state discovered an active iron mine. They decided to marry the prison to economic development and we were off to the races with prisons being used as a vehicle for economic development. And that was true in 1817 when Auburn opened. And it was true in 1999 when the last prison in the North Country that opened uh, the upstate correctional facility in Malone opened. So that's, I think, one of the fundamental problems is that incarceration has always been seen as economic development. And yes, people have to, you know, obviously work in these facilities and they need employees. But when you build an economy around that kind of uh, industry that can contract really at any time, I mean, that, you know, could disappear uh, quickly, that's not really sustainable. You know, it's a tricky situation because Yes, white people in the North Country need to know that their livelihoods, their middle class comforts, uh, their ski trails, their campsites, their roadways, uh, their riverbanks have been taken care of and managed by incarcerated men of color, right? That everyone in the North Country, whether you work in a prison or not, is invested in this, this system. So, Yes, we have to acknowledge that this region has benefited off of the pain of incarcerated people of color and their families, um, many of whom were convicted and sentenced for nonviolent offenses. That's absolutely true. And there's not as much recognition of that fact here as there should be. But at the same time, there's another complicated part of this, which you suggested in your question, Joe, which is that what do you do if these prisons close, right? People have built their livelihoods around them. I mean, my father, without my father's job, I don't know what we would have done. And I'm sure that's true for many uh, people who live in the area. So I would say the place to go to uh, complain is the state government, right? They're the ones who built these facilities. They're the ones who promised, and I point this out in my book, promised repeatedly, We've never had to close prisons, don't worry, they don't shut down. You'll have your recession-proof jobs forever. The state built these prisons. In many cases, they have not kept those promises. And uh, I think both groups, both the people who were incarcerated and their families and the people here who were promised these jobs and now see them being taken away, both have legitimate grievances against the state. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. I I am I'm, yeah. Thank you for that. That's, 
I mean, it's I have never actually thought about the fact that a lot of the environment is 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 stewarded up here by by prisoners and by men of color. And that's a there's a there's a um, Bronwyn, who's one of my students, is asking a question. And I and I and, I, and it's interesting. I just want to link some some of our students together. Right. So so Bronwyn is asking a question about environmental racism. And then I think one of your students, Kimberly Sanchez, um, she says, in my case, growing up, I had many friends go to prison upstate and I grew up in a very urban neighborhood, right? So, um, and then many of our students are from upstate and, and kind of see the prison system in, a, in our neighborhood. We, we drive past these places all the time. Yeah. Um, and, and Bronwyn says, you know, it's, it's kind of like its own form of environmental racism. Mm -hmm. Poor and people of color, people of color, um, are disproportionately incarcerated, and these prisons are built in specific places. Um, and and actually, Aaron Serbone, who I'm going to unmute and see if he wants to to join us here. Um, Jeff, Aaron is a is a reporter at the Adirondack Daily Enterprise. Oh, okay. And uh, and and Aaron, are you there? Yes. Can you, you your comment in the chat is really interesting and, I, and I'm wondering if you can ask it and then I'm going to ask one final question and then we'll call it a night so feel free to ask Jeff any questions you want as a as the kind of local reporter here. Thank you for coming Aaron. No, no problem. Yeah, I was uh, I was at the fusion market the other day that where that's the uh, pickup for the bus there. And I was talking with a guy who was outside who would just been released from FCI Raybrook and he was talking about the area, he had all these questions about uh, recreation, skiing, snowmobiling, everything too. He looked out across the, the water and just wondered about how people feel comfortable walking out on the ice, things like that. And he, he was going back to Albany where he said he'd grown up, he'd spent his whole life there. So I was just wondering what you think about the, the prisons in this area, uh, uh, people come from an urban area often to a rural area but they don't see it outside of the bus windows heading to and from. I'm just wondering what you think that means to them. Yeah, I mean, I did actually find some some evidence uh, that showed what some incarcerated people felt about the region where they were uh, sent to serve their sentences. Um, and now again, you know, you have to sort of look at that evidence with some circumspection because uh, the evidence I found were, were actually news interviews. Um, so you had reporters, incarcerated men, and correction officers sort of all in the same space together. So the incarcerated men, I think, had to sort of be careful with how they phrased their answers. But in general, what I discovered was that most of them actually appreciated the opportunity to be in this area. I mean, I remember reading a story about incarcerated men who were taken to the top of Whiteface Mountain um, and actually worked on the ski trails for the 1980 Winter Olympics. And a reporter went up there, followed them up and asked them like, how do you feel about being up here? Where are you from? Have you ever been in an environment like this before? And many of them reported, you know, appreciating the chance to breathe, you know, clean air, um, to get outdoors, to do the work. And so I think that in general, what I discovered is that there was a positive view of the area where the men were sent to complete their sentences. Um, but at the same time, if they were unhappy, would they have answered uh, negatively. I mean, that's a question that um, I think we have to consider. I mean, we don't have any evidence suggesting that uh, they felt negatively about their their stay in the North Country. Um, I guess the only evidence we have that shows that people weren't happy was the fact that a lot of them tried to escape. Um, and many of them got lost in the woods, got lost in the wilderness, uh, trying to run away from the prisons here. Uh, so obviously there were enough people here that were not enamored of being incarcerated in the Adirondacks that they actually attempted uh, to run away. But you know, as I say, the ones that were interviewed and did comment on it generally had positive views. 
Uh, so Jeff, just a, a quick update from a, from one of my students who is a firefighter, and um, she said that uh, Camp Gabriel's is used as training grounds for the fire department. Oh, that's good. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we maintain it to an, to an extent, and there's discussion of making it a permanent department with firefighter housing in the future. So. Okay, that's great. I want to. I'd love to go in there. I mean, that picture I showed earlier. I took that picture, and I've driven down that road down the road there and i always want to walk down there but i feel like you know dogs are going to like come out and you know <laughs> knock me to the ground or something so well, but i would really love to see like just the buildings and like walk around and and take it all in because um yeah it's just completely shrouded by by the trees there which was part of the state's plan by the way mm. um if you read my book that that um that forest that surrounds that prison was part of the deal that was made to pacify the opposition to the prison was to build vegetative screen so that the public wouldn't be able to actually see uh, the prison. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm I'm still I'm still chewing on your point about um, about the 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 use of prisoners as kind of cheap labor or or you know some people call it slave labor call it a new kind of modern mm -hmm. slave labor um and just the 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 way in which like as a local resident we never talk about the labor that is done um i didn't know that some of the trails at whiteface were cut by prisoners like i'm learning all kinds of things here it's super interesting yeah. um and i and i and i i wonder um you know, po politically, there's there's such a conversation up here about like the forest rangers are really, really stretched. And um, and and I mean, the the politics of New York State has been kind of towards disinvestment in public. It's this kind of neoliberal politics, right? It's like disinvest in public um, public utilities, public institutions, things like that. And I think there's this really interesting question around the the it, the future stewardship of the land here in the Adirondacks. And who's going to do it um, and, and who's going to do it in the absence of this kind of cheap, free, uh, all kinds of problematic labor source, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I don't know that we know an answer to that. It's just an, it's an interesting question. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. I mean, to your point, your, your, one of your first points, it's definitely a part of the local history that few, I mean, I think a lot of people know about it, but just don't want to acknowledge it. Um, I don't want to give away too much of my book because I do want people to read it, but um, <laughs> when there were opposition groups that formed to try to stop some of the prisons from being built, oftentimes the corrections department responded by saying, well, you know, if you let us open the prison, we'll give you all these free workers and, you know, you won't have to pay them. We'll pay them a dollar a day. They'll do all kinds of work for you. Um, and that was always part of the sort of salesmanship campaign of the corrections department it was like, OK, we know you don't want a prison in town. We know you, you hate it, but look at all the benefits your town yeah. is going to. to get. I mean, Paul Smith's talk, how will these um, uh, workers be replaced? How will there be uh, funds to pay for the important jobs that they've completed for very little money? Um, it's really an open question. Um, and it's, a, it's one that has to be answered because um, the number of incarcerated people available to do these jobs is just diminishing um, as the years go by. Hey Jeff, um, can you can you still hear me? Okay. I can hear you. 
Yeah, my my internet I think is getting getting weird here. Um, I have I have one okay. final question for you. Um, and uh, and it, it's a it's a question from Donna Rilling. Donna Rilling was one of my professors at Stony Brook. Very yeah. good friend too. Yeah. Yeah. So so you ready for this question? Here it comes. Um, it says, oh, I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> it says not a critical question, but if you have time, and and I want to end on this one because I think it's really there's a lot of <laughs> students in the in the in the participant queue. So um, so Dr. Hall was in a grad seminar that I taught many years ago and wrote an early research paper that became his dissertation and then his book. Perhaps students would be interested in a few comments regarding the long trajectory um, of academic research and publication, as well as how the shape of his work has changed. Um, and one of your students actually asked if you had any challenges while you were doing this work. So. I guess, could you just talk about like, <laughs> what, what is it like to research something for a long, long time? <laughs> oh my God. Um, thank you, Donna, for the question. Um, and it's a good question. I, I think students sometimes have interests and they just don't really know how to get from one stage to the next. So it is a good question. Um, so you have to read a lot. Uh, you have to identify the fields that you're working in, and then you have to absorb as much knowledge as possible um, about what's already been written, right? So you have to become an expert in your field. So I had to read a lot of environmental history. I had to read a lot of uh, labor history, uh, history of prisons, and a couple other fields. And I basically read hundreds of books, journal articles, and became conversant in those fields and started to figure out how I would make a contribution uh, with my work. Research was often very difficult. Uh, I'll just tell a little story. Sometimes I tell my students when we're meeting in person. Most of the sources for my book came from the Adirondack Park Agency. Um, the corrections department does not save all, the state archives, I should say, does not save every single document created by the state government. So for example, you know, documents created by the Department of Correctional Services, um, the state archives will choose which documents it thinks has historical value and then shred the rest. And that was a lesson I only learned maybe two years into this process. So then I was like, oh, you know, crap, what am I going to do? So I sent a Freedom of Information Act request to the Adirondack Park Agency, one page form, and just wrote in pen. It was very informal. I just said, please send me every document you have on the prison in Gabriel's. That was where I started. And I sent it off. And about a month later, I got back to my apartment in Queens. And in my mailbox, there was a little envelope and there were CD-ROMs inside and it was from the APA in Raybrook. And there was a fee, it was $5. And on those CD-ROMs, I'd say there were about 150,000 pages of documents that, <laughs> that the person, I still don't know who did it, but if I ever meet that person, I owe them like, you know, a very expensive dinner or drink because, uh, that person must have just fed documents into a scanner, you know, while reading a novel or something. So then I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this again. So I then went after the documents for Raybrook, got CD-ROMs mailed to me, $5. I requested documents about Lion Mountain, more documents, Tupper Lake, more documents. I had probably 600,000 pages of documents by the time I was done. And everything that the state archives said they had destroyed, copies of those documents were in the APA records. So if you ever, when you're doing your research, if you ever reach that point where you're like, oh, you know, the documents don't exist or they've been destroyed or I can't find them, look at an adjacent agency, look somewhere else where you think they might be because oftentimes copies are held uh, by a different government agency or even by a different uh, public official. And 
you know, if you run into someone like I did at the APA who either just didn't care what I saw or um, just blindly fed the documents into the scanner, then you'll, you know, you'll have a gold mine to work with. And yeah. the, the dissertation, oh, the dissertation, you know, became the, the basis for the book, but the book is a complete rewrite of the dissertation. Um, I completely, I mean, there's maybe 2% of the dissertation still in there. Um, yeah. it was a, it's a completely new project. Yeah. Yeah. As, as, as is often the advice when you turn a dissertation into a book. So, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I, I never did that. I started working on it, <laughs> was, was asked to do that and it seemed like way too much work and I was already working on it. <laughs> um, so, so Jeff, uh, thank you. I know it's getting late. Um, can you stay and hang out for a couple of minutes? I know um, may maybe Aaron, I want to give Aaron another chance to ask you some questions from the newspaper. But, um, sure, yeah. but I just want to say thank you to everybody, your students, my students. Um, and I, Jeff, it would be really fun to think about ways where we could get our students into conversations with one another, um, kind of across geographic great. space, because we, you know, we all live this, all of us. And yeah, so yeah, exactly. um, you know, I think it's a, it's a it would be really interesting. I teach a class right now. Um, I'm a social scientist, so I'm mostly sociology and anthropology, but I teach a class on social issues and, um, and, and we are gonna be talking about policing and, and you know, I teach a lot of environmental justice stuff. So that'd be really cool. Let's, let's talk about that. Um, yeah, that'd be great. But otherwise, um, everybody who's 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 here, thank you for joining us. This has been super interesting. I've learned a ton. Um, thank you for spending part of your Thursday night with us. Um, see you, you later, um, Aaron. Uh, if you can, if Aaron, do you want to ask any other questions? Um, yeah, I was uh, I was curious if the APA is still involved in uh, the the prisons up here at all. Anytime that there's construction, they're involved. Um, so, you know, for example, when I was requesting the documents for Raybrook for the state prison, the documents I got ranged from the 1970s to the 2000s. Uh, so anytime there is renovation or new construction, they're absolutely involved in providing that sort of non-binding advisory review where they basically will study the project and uh, determine the types of impacts it might have on the local environment and then make recommendations, but they're non-binding. So the corrections department can either choose to follow them or just ignore them. That's interesting. So they, they're, they're more advisory than in other projects then because it's state property yeah any 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 projects going on on public land inside uh the park does fall under their purview um but they can't they don't have the same power that they would have like if uh for example if i bought a house in saranac lake and wanted to you know put an addition on it then you know if i then they would have the power if they they would have the legal power to stop me if they wanted to. Um, if a prison wants to double in size and it has the property to do so, um, it may be destructive, it may be harmful, but the APA ultimately can only issue recommendations but can't stop the project. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering what the, the impact of the prisons and the construction of the prisons has on the, the the communities that they're in, uh, psychology and otherwise. That's a very good question. Um, the I know that when they were being built, that public safety was uh, a great concern. Uh, in fact, there's a really rich correspondence that I referred to during my presentation uh, about the prison in Gabriel's. Um, hundreds of letters written to the to the APA about that project. Um, also, close to 100 letters, I think, written about the project in Tupper Lake. And much of it uh, concerned the possibility of escapes. Um, but much of it was blatantly racist. I mean, one of the uh, one of the sort of recurring issues 
was this fear that incarcerated people's family members would move to the community and siphon off public assistance resources that local residents believed should be designated for people who already lived here. So there was this sort of racial anxiety um, about people who weren't even imprisoned moving to the community. There was this anxiety about people escaping and running away. There was anxiety about the spread of HIV AIDS and uh, anti-prison groups stoked that fear on more than one occasion. Uh, so definitely when the projects were being planned, there was sort of tensions were really high and emotions were high. But what I've found in my research is that once the prisons opened, the dust really did settle. Um, you know, there were occasional escapes and moments of tension, but in general, the communities sort of just moved on. I mean, the prisons were there, they operated, people worked in them, people ran away sometimes, usually they were recaptured pretty quickly. Um, but life more or less proceeded as it had before, um, with, of course, the added benefit of all of these new, very inexpensive workers who were maintaining uh, the local infrastructure. There had been a question earlier about how to convince um, white people living here that prison closures are not a bad thing for society at large. I think that mm -hmm. pro probably one of those things would be, uh, one of those ways to do that would be uh, some sort of replacement industry. Is there an industry that is poised to replace prisons? Uh, I mean, we can look at the three prisons that have closed um, just in the past 12 years uh, to see that I don't know that we know the answer to that question yet. I mean, the Gabriel's prison was supposed to be repurposed as a summer camp um, but there was some difficulty with actually reverting the property from state property back to private property, which it had been in the past. And I know that that was one of the sticking points for a couple of years um, with that project. The prison in Chateauguay, which is not inside the park, but is you know very close, that facility is only 30 years old. It's just sitting there. Um, they tried to auction it off. Um, I think I think someone actually did purchase it, um, but nothing's happening there. Uh, and then the prison in Lion Mountain I showed the picture of. I don't know if anybody here has been through Lion Mountain recently, but you can just drive through that town and not see any cars or people. Um, and the prison, you can go right up to it. Um, you know, I went, walked around, went right up to the doors and um, it's falling apart. Someone did buy it, a, a man from Canada purchased it um, at the auction that the state held. But I don't know. I mean, you would think that there would be a market for building summer camps because that's been a historical part of the economy in the Adirondacks. But I talked to someone about this a few weeks ago and the person responded, well, you know, I would never send my child to a, a former prison <laughs> for a summer camp. So, um, it's hard to say. I mean, I if I had to if I had to look in my crystal crystal ball, I would say some of these places are going to be torn down. Um, you know, maybe in our lifetime, maybe in the future, um, and it's hard to say what will what will happen. But in Danamora, which only has its prison, there's really no other industry, no other employer there. Um, things are not looking good there, and that uh, could be that could spell serious trouble for that community because that community was founded as a prison community. Um, its whole existence is tied up with that facility. So the annex is supposed to close, prison population continues to go down. There's nothing saying the rest of that prison won't eventually close. Um, and that would be really devastating for that community. Um, and that's not to say that the prison should stay open, right? But it's just to be honest about the fact that there are people whose livelihoods are tied up with that place and um, 
you know, their, their uh, existence also has to be uh, accounted for. Yeah, Jeff, um, it's, it's interesting, the, 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 the sense that that it's almost like this kind of sort of Damocles that's like ha hanging over people's heads, right? Like just kind of ready to come down. That's, uh, I often hear this when, when talking to people who, who live in Tupper Lake. I mean, Sun Mount is a major employer in Tupper Lake. And, and, a, and a lot of jobs that, that where people earn a decent living doing those jobs. Um, and many of them break their bodies doing those jobs too. I mean, we should talk about that as well, that these are really difficult jobs. Um, That's right. And, um, and it, it's, uh, it would really, it would be, it, it would be such a shock to that community. And I'm struck listening to you talk about this, Jeff, that like, this is where I think our, our research kind of comes together. Um, because what you, what you just said is, is almost exactly the same, maybe different, uh, from, from how people talk about transitioning the energy system in the United States. When, when like climate change adaptation necessarily means that like some, like you're going to have to change the energy industry. And that's going to, I ask my students this all the time when we talk about like just, what is a just transition, right? Um, how do you, like, what do we owe the people in um, rural West Virginia who've been mining coal, right? Um, we can't keep mining coal. What do we, what do we do as a society? I mean, I um I don't know that I've heard a, a kind of similar conversation towards like what is a just transition away from like the prison industrial complex, right? It's a it's a is I don't I don't know that pe maybe people have this conversation, but I certainly haven't heard it. Yeah, I mean I I've been writing about it. Just you know, I've started writing some. Uh, some stuff I may try to get published, some ideas I have. Um, but I don't think that, I don't think there's a broader conversation happening about this. Um, I think that part of the reason for that is, and it's a good thing that people see the closure of prisons as a positive development, right? But at the same time, we are not really paying attention to the people whose livelihoods are being upended yeah. by this positive development. So um, it's, yeah, I mean, I, one of the, of course, one of the, I guess, I don't know that you would even call this a solution, but many of the people whose jobs are being eliminated uh, at the annex in Dannemora will simply have to move to other parts of the state and work in other prisons, um, which creates its own, you know, hardship for those people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what do you do when that 176 year old prison eventually closes down? Um, what do you do for that community? Does the state have a responsibility? I think it does. Um, the state built that prison, made a promise to that community and, you know, they're on the hook, I would say. So, um, what that would entail, um, what would be an appropriate sort of compensation for the community? Uh, that's something that I don't think people are really thinking too much about right now. And I mean, I'm thinking about it. I'm sure others are, but I don't think there's a bigger conversation happening. Yeah, it's just, it's so interesting to think about those things. It is getting late. We should probably end this. Yeah. Um, you you okay. are you are still in day two of COVID shots. So um, Aaron, <laughs> that's uh, true. Aaron, I put um, Jeff's contact information way up in the chat. So if you want to get a hold of him, Jeff.